Let me pray before we begin uh, the last message of this series in Isaiah. Father God, I just pray, Lord, that you will speak to all of us through your word. Um, Lord, um, I pray for open minds, open hearts, and that your Holy Spirit will convict us and guide us into all truth. Uh, Lord, I, I, I want to get out of the way and, and just allow you to speak through me. Um, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A quick update, though. I finished my table. I think almost, right? I still need to make it a little bit shiny and then get it inspected and approved. Um, you know? Yeah. 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 Esteban. Esteban is honest, right? He's like nine years old, but he's brutally honest. Um, anyway. Um, and so when I was kind of like trying to finish that table. I told you last week, it's like, yeah, Jesus was a carpenter and that's so cool. And any, anyway, so I got kind of creative when I was making the table and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do a sermon series call. What? The table. Uh, the table. So next week, we're doing a three week series called The Table. And it's all about who we are as the gathering, uh, more about the Church of the Nazarene, the denomination we're a part of and how you can be part of, of, of this family and those of you that are on the fence of going all in with what the gathering stands for and what we are, this is the perfect opportunity. Uh, I may be uh, giving you the option to ask questions or email questions and maybe I'll answer them. But the reason for the table is because at that dining table is where you have some of the deepest conversations, hopefully, with your family or with friends. You sit at the table and you talk. So um, be here. For the next three weeks, uh, I think it's going to be beneficial for all of us uh, in terms of committing ourselves to a long-term vision for the gathering as a church. Amen? And I was supposed to show you a picture of the table, but I forgot to take one, so I'll, I'll post it later. I'll bring a picture next week, or I may bring the whole table for the series, right? <laughs> Let me begin uh, this message with one question, okay? Have you ever seen... God? Tricky question, right? You don't know what to answer. Of course, we sing songs that say, I've seen you move. Uh, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, because I want to see you. But have you ever seen God? That's a deep question. And it's complicated. If we look at scripture, for example, who, who has seen God? We, we know that Moses told God one of those days that he was praying. He says, Lord, show me your glory. And you find a story in Exodus, and the Lord uh, told Moses, you know what? I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, he told Moses. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, but the Lord told Moses, but you cannot see my face because... Uh, no one may see me and live. And so the Lord told Moses, uh, go on this rock, stand on this rock, and when my glory passes by, I will put you in uh, a cleft in the rock and, and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. In other words, I will cover your eyes so that you won't see me face to face. But then I will remove my hand and you will see my back because my face may not be seen. <laughs> Elijah also had a similar encounter with God. He was running for his life, afraid of his life. And the Lord came and told him, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord because the Lord is about to pass by. And we remember the story. The wind came by, the earthquake came, uh, a fire came, but the Lord was not in the fire, was not in the earth, was not in the wind. And, and then Elijah hears a whisper. You remember that story. And that's about as much as he got, a whisper. Jesus, fast forward years later, and Jesus told those following him, if you have seen me, you have seen my father. Philip was having kind of doubts, and, and, and Jesus looks at Philip and says, really, Philip, you've, you've been with me for this long. You've seen me perform miracles and do great things among you, and, and, and you still have your doubts. Don't you know me, Philip? Anyone, Jesus said, 
Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Philip, show us the Father? What a privilege they had, those that knew Jesus and walked with Jesus and saw Jesus do great things, right? I mean, that must have been incredible. Yet, in the midst of that awesome time with Jesus, many, many chose not to believe in him and trust him. In fact, there was one occasion when he multiplied fish and bread, and then he tried to get away. Jesus to take some rest and and the multitude followed him and after they followed him Jesus turned around and said you're just following me because I give you bread and fish and I can satisfy your needs and your hunger but 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 to really follow me you must eat my flesh and drink my blood you are not worthy of me unless you give up everything for me not for what I can give you but for me (laughs) I want a relationship I don't want you to just benefit from what I can multiply and bless And on this moment, we're told in Scripture, I think it's John chapter 6, many of his followers left him. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, yet they have God himself in flesh in front of them, and they chose to turn their back on him and walked away. They missed it. Have you ever seen God? See, as I was thinking about this, I thought, And God is spirit, we're told in Scripture. He's omnipresent, which means He's everywhere at all times. Yet, so many of us miss it. (laughs) Now, we get frustrated at the the followers missing it. I don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss out on God's blessing upon your life, of God's goodness upon your life, of God's guidance upon your life. Now, Scripture tells us that there are plenty of things around us that tell you and me about God, that that proclaim or that reflect the goodness of God, but also the greatness of a Creator. Someone that is bigger than us, greater than us, more powerful than us. (laughs) It's beyond what we can understand, measure, or or grasp, right? God is greater for sure. Romans chapter 1 puts it this way in verse 20. It says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, and then he adds on it, his eternal power. His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people, not just some people, but people, all people, are without excuse. When you look around, when you're walking on the street and and you look up at night and see the sky and the vast sky and the stars and when you see creation and trees and God's divine design you see things that tell you about a God that is invisible powerful and extremely intelligent and you see in Isaiah we find God's people confused Israel is confused Israel cannot see God they are blinded because of sin Because sin blinds you to your need of God. Sadly, in our Christian culture today, we are deceived with this idea that, yeah, you can live in sin. God loves you anyway. (laughs) Dangerous place to be at. Israel was confused. Israel was blinded by sin, blinded by rebellion, and somehow they could not see God working in their midst. They could not figure out that the reason they're receiving oppression and punishment and things are not working for their good is because of their own sin and rebellion. We talked about this in chapter 1 of Isaiah. God said, I already, I already, I already punish you. You already, you already got rear-ended by me, right? It's like, I already, I already gave you a spanking and you still don't understand. Now we have been learning some things found in the book of Isaiah, and as you may recall, the constant tension in Isaiah 
is between hope and hopelessness, uh, between judgment and mercy, between punishment and forgiveness. It seems like God is done with them and also not done with them because as he's trying to bring about justice, he wants to keep a remnant to bring about salvation to them and ultimately to the whole world. So have you seen God? Have you ever seen God? It seems like God must bring justice, but along the way, he keeps showing his mercy. But may I remind you that we're living under God's mercy right now? Amen. That as much as we can get frustrated about sin and corruption and sexual promiscuity and abuse and unfaithfulness and deceive, God sees all those things, but he chooses to wait because of his mercy, because he has a remnant still in this world trying to bring about the good news about salvation, salvation about a God that is a good God, that is a forgiving God. So let me ask you one more time, because as much as I want to explore the whole book of Isaiah, I, I want to conclude this series with a personal challenge. Have you ever seen God? Have you ever seen God? <laughs> I want to pick up just a few verses to finish up this series in chapter 40 of Isaiah. Now surely Isaiah will, will become handy around Christmas time and hopefully it will connect some things and remind you some things as we, as, as we dive into the Christmas series in December, which is not that far away. But, but for now we're going to end it here in chapter 40, verse 28. Just, just a few verses. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Now remember, this is God talking to Israel, who is supposed to know. And who at some point heard. <laughs> the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. And his understanding, no one can fathom. Fathom, right? The word. Understand. Measure. Uh, it's beyond us. Now, if you're paying attention, and, and if you look around when, when you're out there, one of, one of the first things you notice about creation itself is that whoever created all things is an unlimited great being that has more power than any has ever seen. This uh, past week, I went to uh, Colorado, northwest of Colorado, Estes Park, about uh, 80 miles northwest from Denver. Uh, I was surrounded by a couple hundred of, of pastors from USA and Canada. And by the way, it, great experience. Uh, the aim was to inspire pastors to preach uh, in an evangelistic way and to encourage our churches to reach the lost in our community and to bring them to the knowledge of who Jesus is. But that's for another series. I, I may talk more about it here in the coming weeks. But, of course, there was a lot of walking. Um, in, in fact, uh, the, the campground was spread out. So when I got there, I had trouble finding the checking building. And when I found it, I found out that I had to walk all the way again to my car and then walk all the way to the check-in and then walk all to the dorms and lots of walking. And then the altitude doesn't help, right? Among some other things that I don't need to mention. But while we were walking, uh, I was walking with a group of pastors. I looked up and I saw more stars that I had seen recently. <laughs> I mean, just... Many, many. I didn't know there were that many. I don't know why they get that many and we don't. But as we were walking, I, I looked up and I saw a shooting star. Right? And it was like 10 of us and, and another pastor said, did you see that? Did you see the shooting star? I said, yeah, I saw it. Yeah, whoever, who, who else saw it? The other ones didn't see it. They, they were not looking up. And for the next few days, I could not stop thinking about it because when you look at the sky with one of those uh, stargazing apps. Have you, have you ever done that? The, the app shows you shooting star after shooting star after shooting star that your eyes cannot see, but they are there. And um, 
it just reminded me of a few things. You know, I've been teaching a, a, a class to third and fifth graders in our, in our co-op about, about why our faith in Christ is reliable, beginning with creation and the uh, cosmological argument and all that kind of thing. And so I, I got to thinking, and I got to thinking more, and I was like, man, I, I lose perspective of how small I am very, very quickly. If you think, for example, about the size of the planets, right, you got... You got the, the, the planets lined up here, and, and you have the sun, right, and Mercury, and Venus, and Earth. You're, we're right there, right? But look at the size of Jupiter, or Saturn, or the one I'm going to skip for the sake of playing it safe, and Neptune. Right? That, that, that's our solar system. Now... In our solar system, the majority of uh, the system's mass is in the sun. About 99.86% is contained in the sun. The remaining majority is in Jupiter. Jupiter is big. Uh, this planet Jupiter, we just see it big and we, we don't realize how important it is. Go to the next picture of Jupiter. See, that's North America compared to Jupiter. Now, the, the, the benefit of Jupiter for us is that it's, it's so big and, and its magnet force is so strong that, that Jupiter is there just catching the, the, the comets that are headed to the Earth, keeping us safe. In other words, if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. It's like a shield for us. Now, Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. In fact, in its surface area... You could, you could fit 122 Earths. Let that sink in. 122. Isn't that impressive? It's, uh, it's, so, it's so big that if you combine the masses of the remaining solar system planets, Jupiter would still be two and a half times bigger. And then, and then look, if you line up all the planets by size... Or, I guess, in order, but just one next. Can you, can you spot Earth there? I mean, you see Saturn, right? Now go, go back, and then you have Jupiter, right? What's before Jupiter? Mars, okay. Can you see Mars? <laughs> well, the Earth is that little dot right there. I, I didn't put a mark on it, but, but it's a little dot right there next to Jupiter, the sun is huge. It's big. In fact, uh, you could fit in its surface area 12,000 Earths. I'm going to let you think about that one. It takes 8 minutes and 19 seconds for the light from the sun to reach our planet. Mind-blowing, isn't it? Now, as I was reading, uh, there is a process in which, you know, the sun may come to nothing because of the energy spent. But at the end of the information, it says that we shouldn't worry about it because it's probably going to take about five billion years or so. I don't know about that. But what I know is that only a greater being could create something like this. Now, as I was looking at the stars, go to the next picture, please. I, I, I realized, see, that's our galaxy. And so when you go out, let's say, in the open, and you see many, many stars, and you can see beyond your thing, you're, you, you, you're looking at, at, at eternity, right? Well, all the stars you see at night are just part of this little yellow circle right there. That's as much as you can see. I, I saw somewhere that if you, if you would put the, the galaxy and, and, and put it at the, at the size of the U.S., you know, shrink it in proportion, right? The solar system would be the size of a thumbprint. Let that sink in for a moment. Now, on top of that, I found out that the average distance between stars in our galaxy is... 30 trillion miles. 
And the distance is needed for earth to exist in its present life supporting position. God is greater than us. So let me ask you once again, have you ever seen God? Now looking up to bigger than us is just as overwhelming as looking at the microscopic world. I found out a few months ago about this uh, investigative journey and, and, and there's this uh, guy, I found his tweet, his, his direct tweet. I'm going to read it for you. His name is Prash Singh. And he wrote this. He, he wrote, my grandfather built motors that powered big machines. Now, you know how a motor works, right? It has like gears that make something rotate and, you know. And then he went on to say, in a lab, not so different from his workshop, my colleagues and I uncovered. What does it mean uncovered? That he was there. Nobody made it. They just found it. It's just like we discovered or uncovered gravity, right? Uh, the assembly of the bacterial motor. Now, you know what a bacteria is like. It's tiny. It's small. In fact, a bacteria is only one cell but has no nucleus and bacteria are small. Each one is about one hundredth the size of a human cell. One hundredth the size of a human cell. And so what this guy uncovered, along with his colleagues, is something inside bacteria that looks like this picture I'm about to show you. What does that look like? These are gears inside bacteria. They, they rotate, and then I, I wish you could see the animation of it. I may find it and post it later on, on, online somewhere. But, but you see the, the, big, the big circle there at the bottom? It... it it rotates and it makes the other gears rotate. And we thought that we had created motors, but God was ahead of us. That's inside bacteria. It's complex. It's beyond us. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 9 says, The wise will be put to shame. They will be dismayed and trapped since they have rejected the word of the Lord. What kind of wisdom do they have? And so we're talking about God's power and God's greatness, but what about God's sovereignty, right? Romans 9 kind of quotes what we read before when God was talking to Moses. It says, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And the reason I bring about God's sovereignty is because that's one of the biggest arguments against a good God, if God is good, how could he allow evil? But he's not that he's allowing evil, he's that he's beyond time and he's taking care of things. But from our perspective, we can see the full picture. But God is sovereign and he can do as he pleases. Right? He is in full control. And he's good and he's faithful and he's good no matter how he made you. He's good no matter... What you're going through, what you've been through, God is good. And who can argue or how can you argue with the creator? Now we can talk about how God knows what is best for us. In Isaiah 43 verse 1, for example, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who formed you, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are Mine. When Israel starts questioning God about the way they have been experiencing life, they question God and God says, listen, I owe you nothing. I own you. And when you choose, right, if you will choose to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and give him your life, you are no longer your own. You're his. And God can look down when you complain and says, listen, I don't owe you. I own you. <laughs> it's something I heard this week at, at the preacher's conference. And, 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 and it's stuck in my head because it's the truth. 
But we get in trouble when we want to do our thing, but want God to, to bless our thing. <laughs> in other words, we own ourselves, but we want, we want God's blessing upon it when God is saying, listen, if you would just trust me with your whole heart, and if you get to know me, 1 Peter 4.19 says, So then, those who suffer, now this is important, according to God's will. Sometimes you suffer not according to your, God's will, but to your will, and that's even worse, <laughs> should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. What I'm trying to tell you is that God is trustworthy and God is reliable and God doesn't fail and God has the full picture. Now, we could talk about God's sovereignty, but we don't have all the time. We mentioned it. We could also talk about the goodness of suffering. You know, suffering sometimes is good for us. <laughs> sometimes it makes us snap out of it. If we need to snap out of something, sometimes it just gives us more faith, more courage. When you have deadlines, you are better under pressure, right, commonly. Or at least you should. That's why, that's why you have an alarm to wake up and go to work. And that's why you have responsibilities. And as you grow up, those responsibilities make you stronger, right? But the testing of your faith is only by testing your faith. And so in the midst of trials and suffering, God still cares for you. And when we suffer, he notices. He knows that it hurts. And he cares and he's moved by our cry to him and our calling upon his name in the midst of, his, of our suffering. Is the Father's love. The Father's love. I've been hesitant about sharing this story. I shared it in the first service and I wasn't sure I would share it now, but I will. I got the opportunity to sit down with my parents for a couple hours this Friday morning. My father is about 80 years old. And uh, out of the blue, my mom got up, went to the bedroom, and my dad just started talking to me. And with watery eyes, uh, some memories were coming back to him. And he just looked at me and said, hey, listen, I, I can figure out what to do with this big dagger that I have. He said, it's like this big. And the reason I got that years ago is because a long time ago, quite some years back, my older brother, he's about 10 years older than me, he was at a party and somebody stabbed him. And it was this close to one of his organs that could have, you know, killed him. Thankfully, he didn't die. But the reason it comes back to me is because the father's love is so great <laughs> And my dad is a great dad. I mean, he, he was present. He was playful. He loved all of us. We are three brothers. And with watery eyes, he was telling me, and, and I got that dagger because I wanted to find who stabbed your brother. I wanted to bring justice. He kept telling me the story, he said. So I, I found some old friends, not the good kind of friends, if you know what I mean. And he told them, hey, listen, my, my son, he went through this. And I need to find who did it. A few weeks later, the guys came to the house and said, hey, we found him. How do you want to go about it? My dad said they got in the car and they were headed that way. And before they got to their destination, whoever did it was killed by someone else. But when I saw my dad with such passion and anger and desire for justice, I couldn't help it as a good preacher to think about the kind of anger, righteous anger, that our Father in heaven must have against sin and depravity and corruption and deceit and sexual promiscuity and all the things that separate us from Him. It's righteous anger. He didn't plan it that way, but He gave us free will, but sin corrupted us. And sin blinds us from seeing and experiencing his goodness. And I told my dad, it's the same. 
The same kind of love that the Father has for us, but instead of Him trying to come and destroy us, He sent His only Son, His only begotten Son, to be punished for the sin that we committed so that we wouldn't have to suffer. Justice, right? <laughs> you know, I was, as I was kept thinking about this, I thought, man, why, why would God love us so much? I mean, you saw the greatness of creation in a split second. He could get rid of us if he wanted to. So I started thinking about creation and, you know, first day, second day, third day. He creates all the setting for putting life in it. First day, divide light from darkness. Second day, divides waters above from waters below. Third day, divides water that are, waters that are on the planet from the land. And so he did all this How? How did God create all things? By His Word. He spoke, right? <laughs> you see, I, I love technology. And I, as I was building that table this, this past week, I, I was thinking, man, I, I, like, I like easy things. Like when we go to bed at night after like, okay, let's, let's go to sleep. I, I don't have to get up and turn off the light. I just, I just say, hey, Siri, turn off the bedroom lights. All right? But I couldn't do that with the table. I couldn't say, hey, Siri, build me a table. I had to get up and cut the wood and do the drill and put the stain. And, you know, you have to put work in it. And so, so God here, uh, just for the sake of the illustration, he's just sitting on his chair and said, let it be light. And the planets, right? And the earth and the water. And, and, and the animals, and, and, and then the, the next three days, day four, he, he fills the chasm of day one. It says, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate day from night. So let there be day and night on earth. Day five, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing in which the water teems and that moves about in it. According to their kind. And so God just spoke. Day six, he, he, he let the, lets the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. And so now we have livestock, by the way. When I was there, it, it was a funny picture. I, I, I had a picture, and I, I didn't have time to uh, send it to Kellen to show it to you. But uh, let, me, let me find it here. I'm, I'm not going to be able to show it to you, but I'm going to read it to you. It, it, it had a warning. <laughs> There on the mountains, it said, aggressive elk in area. Maintain a minimum distance of 75 feet for your own safety. Aggressive elk, big letters. Guess how close I got. I'll post a picture too later. All of us were getting just close, taking pictures of the elk. Anyway, but God creates all this by his word, but about half day of the sixth day, he gets up, right? And out of dust, he creates man. He walks over to a patch of clay outside the Garden of Eden, and with his hands, he created man. Genesis chapter 2 gives us a better picture. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. God is personal. I think we've made the mistake of clinging on to God's unending love, which is true. God's love for all, which is true. That we have forgotten that sin, <laughs> sin doesn't allow God's love to be fully manifested in our lives. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you're hiding sin, if you're playing with sin in your life, God's love, as much as you can acknowledge it, won't be beneficial for your life. That was Israel's problem. 
They knew God, they had a form of godliness, but they were corrupted. They were halfway in, halfway out. In fact, Isaiah 59 puts it this way. It says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. Of course he's not. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who should believe in him or who would believe in him would not perish. Of course. But verse 2 says, but your iniquities. This is Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Now, it doesn't mean that he cannot hear, but, but hear implies action, response. When, when, when we say, hear, hear me, God, we're, we're saying, do something about it, not just hear me, right? So have you ever seen God? And if you have ever seen God, can God see you? Can God hear you? Jesus, after he was baptized, the first thing he began to preach was repentance. Because without repentance, there cannot be forgiveness. And without forgiveness, his love cannot be fully manifested in your life. Sin separates us from God. A God that is eternal or powerful or loving and who wants us to trust Him wholeheartedly. So have you ever seen God? So I say a 40, going back to where we started. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary or tired. And His understanding no one can understand. But then verse 29, famous passage, we all have seen it on shirts and whatnot. He gives strength to the weary, increases power to the weak. Even, even people like us get tired. Youth get tired and weary. And young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Would you stand up with me as we prepare to worship? Have you ever seen God? <laughs> Just as it was for Israel, it is for us. Faith in God's promises is the single most important reality for the Lord's people. Faith is the sustaining strength of the Lord's people in life's dark days. Are you going through difficult situations? Keep on, hang on to your faith wholeheartedly. Isaiah also reminds us that faith works and faith proves itself in obedience faith as the new testament writer tells us without works is dead so let me ask you one last time have you ever seen god let me remind you that god sees you he knows you by name and he wants to hear you father god it is our prayer this morning that you will remind all of us how much we need you. Lord, that as we leave this place and then look up to the sky and see nature around us, we may be reminded of a good, loving Father who wanted to bring justice. And the way to bring justice was sending His own Son to receive the punishment that we deserved. Lord, we don't want you to hide our face from us. So we confess our sin. We cry out to you and we ask that you allow us to get rid of all unrighteousness. That we may offer ourselves our living sacrifices before you. Pleasing to you. Lord, help us to crucify the flesh. And Lord, if you can keep the planets rotating and moving around. You surely can take care of our problems. <laughs> you surely can take care of our burdens. You surely can 
Help us to be strong in times of need and fear and uncertainty. Lord, I pray for those that are going through difficult circumstances right now in this room. Holy Spirit, come and touch them and minister to them and remind them that you are trustworthy, that you are faithful, and that you love us and that you want your love to transform us into your likeness. Hey, listen, as we worship, if today is a day when you feel like you need prayer, would you just come forward and we'll pray over you? If this is the day that you say, I want to get rid of sin and I want to give my life fully to Christ, would you come forward and just make things right with the Lord? As we worship, if you have a need, just come forward. We, we want to pray over you. Amen. Let's worship.